This might sound like a perfectly normal song, but don't be fooled, because the person singing is a convicted serial killer with a dark past. Police actually found this recording at his abandoned campsite, where he would lay in wait while searching for his next victim. It was the start of a brand new academic year at the University of Florida in Gainesville, and the once sleepy college town was suddenly buzzing with excitement. But as thousands of students flocked to the campus, they were completely unaware that the devil was watching their every move. In less than a week, five innocent students were savagely murdered and mutilated at the hands of a deranged lunatic, and the entire nation watched in terror as investigators scrambled to capture the killer. Still, no one could have predicted where this twisted case would ultimately lead. Let's start at the beginning. On Friday, August 24, 1990, 18-year-old Sonia Larson and 17-year-old Christina Powell were excitedly unloading their cars at Knopf Campus Apartment. The two incoming freshmen had met during the summer semester and decided to get a place together for the academic year. After a long day of moving, Sonia and Christina decided to call it a night and planned to wake up early the following day to unpack. But unfortunately, they would never get to see the second day in their new home. Christina's parents had tried to reach her all day on Saturday, but to no avail. Still, they assumed she was probably out partying and figured they'd just see her during their planned visit on Sunday. So they arrived at the Gainesville apartment later that weekend, anxious to see their daughter safe and sound. But no one answered their knocks on the door. Sensing that something was very wrong, the worried parents called the police. The responding police officer ultimately wound up breaking down a second floor door to enter the residence, and what he saw was enough to haunt his dreams for the rest of his life. Sonia's blood-soaked body was found on her bed, with both legs hanging off the edge. She had been stabbed to death, and the wounds were so severe that authorities actually had to use dental records to confirm her identity. While her body showed signs of a desperate fight for her life, the medical examiner noted that it appeared to have been a blitz-style attack. As the officer moved downstairs, he found Christina lying spread eagle on the living room floor. The killer had placed both a bottle of cleaning solution and a towel between her legs, and horrifically, they had also removed both of her nipples with surgical precision, leaving behind three-inch circles of missing flesh. Neighbors of the two young women told police that they had heard the song Faith by George Michael blaring from their apartment either late Friday night or early Saturday morning. They also reported hearing loud thumps during that time and a shower running at around 6 a.m. on Saturday morning. During this chaotic time, authorities worked to reassure the public that these brutal attacks were likely an isolated incident caused by a jealous boyfriend or someone else who might have known the two women. But they were in for the shock of a lifetime. Two days after Sonia and Christina's murders, Gainesville police received a call from the nearby Alaqua County Sheriff's Office, where 18-year-old Krista Hoyt was employed as a part-time file clerk. She was incredibly dependable, so her co-workers requested a welfare check when she failed to show up for her midnight shift. The on-call sheriff went to her apartment, less than three miles from Sonia and Christina's residence, and got no response at the door. So he went around to a back window, completely unprepared for what was coming next. He looked through the glass into Krista's bedroom and felt the blood in his veins turn to ice. Krista's lifeless body was hideously bent at the waist and positioned on the edge of her waterbed with mirrors carefully placed all around her for dramatic effect. She was naked except for socks and sneakers, but that's only the beginning. Someone had cut off her nipples and sliced open her abdomen from the chest down to the pelvis. The thriving young woman had also been decapitated, and the killer mockingly placed her head on a bookshelf to stare back at the mutilated corpse. These details are the hallmarks of a serial killer, as they often leave a signature or modus operandi for their crime, such as cutting off victims' nipples and positioning the bodies. As well, the killer's behavior seems to have escalated after the first attacks on Sonia and Christina, as Krista's body had increased signs of mutilation. It's possible that in order to reach the same level of excitement that they felt with the first two attacks, the killer had to do more with the next victim in order to feel that same thrill. Now that three young women in Gainesville had been barbarically murdered in the span of 24 hours, police were starting to suspect they might have a sadistic serial killer on their hands. As news circulated around the campus, some parents even insisted that their children return home for the entire semester. Those who stayed began taking extra precautions, purchasing weapons and seeking protection in numbers during the night. Still, those measures wouldn't be enough to save Tracy Palaz and Manuel Taboda. 
Tracy and Manuel were both 23 years old and longtime high school friends who lived together in a popular off-campus apartment complex. Tracy was reportedly very nervous about the recent attacks, but she felt a sense of security living with a male roommate. So on the evening of August 27th, she waited for Manuel to return home from work before taking a shower. But little did she know that someone was already watching them. The next day, one of Tracy's friends was concerned by her absence from class, so she contacted a maintenance worker at the apartment complex, who used a master key to gain entry to their unit. Inside, he immediately saw Tracy's nude body on display in the hallway, with an ominous trail of blood indicating someone had dragged her out from her bedroom after stabbing her to death. Her hair was still wet from the shower she had taken when Manuel got home. Manuel was in his bedroom, also killed by countless stab wounds. He had apparent defense wounds and blood spatter on the wall suggested he had attempted to fend off the attacker in a frenzied struggle. In the wake of these five horrific slayings, the entire Gainesville community entered a state of hysteria. Students were fleeing the campus as police grappled for clues that would help them catch the person responsible before they got the chance to strike again. Meanwhile, camera crews and journalists flooded in to satisfy the nation's curiosity surrounding the savage attacks, and they were about to get much more than they bargained for. After a 72-hour long deadly rampage, the killing suddenly stopped, leaving an eerie silence for those left behind. Then, the day after Tracy and Manuel's bodies were discovered, detectives located a rough campsite in a nearby wooded area. It was there that they found a cassette tape containing eerie recordings of songs that appeared to refer to the murders. The theme of this song is power. The mystery writer is the Grim Reaper who has the power to choose who lives and who dies. He has the power to evade the Ten Star, i.e. the police. The chorus of the song also suggests that he enjoys the fact that everyone is wondering what his real identity is and what his motive may be. The Gainesville police held a press conference to inform the public that they were forming a massive task force of roughly 100 detectives to work the investigation. It would become the most extensive manhunt in Florida's history. However, to preserve the integrity of the case, officials didn't tell the public that they already had an extremely valuable suspect in mind, Edward Lewis Humphrey. On August 30th, 20-year-old Ed was apprehended in Gainesville and charged with battery following a fight with his grandmother. The troubled young man was enrolled as a freshman at the University of Florida and bore many scars on his face and a significant limp as the result of two car accidents. Ed was, by all accounts, a very typical high school student, but after his parents went through a nasty divorce and his beloved grandfather died, something in him changed, making him angry and violent. The very few friends he had described him as a recluse who often carried a hunting knife. Ed was eventually diagnosed as manic depressive and hospitalized on more than one occasion. The police were also called to his residence several times following reports of him acting berserk. Around the time of his enrollment at the University of Florida, Ed's behavior worsened and became more unpredictable, and then the killings began. So investigators set his bail at $1 million and held him in a 10-foot by 10-foot concrete cell while they focused on gathering more evidence against him. But despite their best efforts, detectives couldn't stop the media from catching wind of their prime suspect, and soon, Ed Humphrey's name was all over the local paper. During his interrogation, Ed rambled on to investigators about his split personality and insisted that John in the Bible had committed the brutal crimes. He also placed himself right around Sonia and Christina's apartment on the night they were murdered. Split personality refers to a psychological disorder called dissociative identity disorder which was previously known as Multiple Personality Disorder. True Dissociative Identity Disorder, DID, is quite rare and often is considered to be controversial. In fact, today many professionals will not diagnose someone with DID. Still, a search warrant was executed on Ed's car, grandmother's house, and the Gainesville apartment where he sporadically stayed. 
Investigators found several knives and seized his sneakers to compare them to prints found at the third crime scene. They also located three magazines containing articles about decapitation in a pillowcase. Experts then compared the DNA found at the various crime scenes, including hairs, blood, and seminal fluid, to Ed. While they didn't return a match, this information led detectives to believe that two people had been responsible for the crimes. Still, that alone wasn't enough to guarantee a conviction, and investigators began looking for Ed's accomplice. They decided to look for clues in other unsolved murder cases, and quickly zeroed in on a 1989 slaying in Shreveport, Louisiana. The victims were 24-year-old Julie Grissom, her 55-year-old father Tom, and 8-year-old nephew, Sean. The trio had been savagely attacked in the residential neighborhood where they lived, and the motive didn't appear to be robbery, but something far more sinister is what caught the attention of investigators. The murders appeared to have been done hastily, with Julie being the primary target. While all three were stabbed to death, the young woman had been crudely positioned for dramatic effect, just like the Gainesville cases. The killer even took the time to fan her hair out in a sort of halo around her head. Investigators felt like they were onto something, but they were about to receive the shock of a lifetime. On September 7th, 1990, officers were called to a Winn-Dixie grocery store in Ocala, roughly 40 miles from Gainesville, where the manager was being held at gunpoint. The assailant gathered money from the registers and then ran out of the store to a nearby parking lot. Upon arrival, officers located the man sitting inside a stolen Mustang, and when asked to surrender, he briefly pretended to comply before accelerating straight into traffic. After colliding with another vehicle, the driver proceeded to take off on foot, but police quickly caught up and arrested him. The offender's name was Danny Harold Rowling, and he had a lot to say. Without prompting, Danny openly confessed to stealing the Mustang and, even more shockingly, shooting his father in the face and stomach. Detectives subsequently found out there was an outstanding warrant on Danny for the attempted murder of his father. He waived his right to a public attorney and instead entered guilty pleas to armed robbery, possession of a firearm by a felon, and fleeing and eluding police officers. During his time in the Marion County Jail awaiting trial, Danny allegedly attempted to take his own life and also tried to escape through a window. An order was also approved to have him considered a habitual offender, given his lengthy criminal history, including countless burglaries. Detectives eventually discovered that Danny shared a blood type with the Gainesville Ripper, the name given to the murderer by the media, so they requested his consent for a DNA sample. Danny agreed, and in addition to collecting blood, authorities also removed one of his decaying molars as evidence. Days later, the lab returned results that would send a wave of shock across the nation. All 12 enzymes present in the crime scene DNA were found in Danny's blood. And after a second test concluded the same results five days later, police believed they had found Ed's accomplice. After that, details began emerging about Danny's personal life, revealing a long history of resistance to authority and mental health issues. Danny had been apprehended for multiple armed robberies in 1979, and during his time in jail, a psychologist diagnosed him with a personality disorder. He was released in 1984, but immediately returned to his criminal habits, landing him back in jail once again. Danny was released on parole in 1988, but he struggled to keep a job. Detectives then made the bone-chilling discovery that he had been fired from a restaurant job in his hometown of Shreveport on November 4, 1989, the exact same day of the Grissom family murders. During this time, investigators also learned about the tumultuous relationship between Danny and his father. Danny reportedly turned to music, drugs, and alcohol to cope with the abuse at home. They also discovered how things took a violent turn on May 18, 1990. The pair got into a heated argument that resulted in Danny shooting his father before fleeing to Gainesville. His father survived the attack but told authorities that he didn't believe his son capable of cold-blooded murder. The abuse Danny suffered as a child likely had a huge effect on his development and played a role in his own violent behavior later in life. Nevertheless, Danny was given an automatic life sentence as a habitual offender for the armed robbery at the grocery store. He also received three additional life sentences for his other outstanding charges. Still, while Danny was incarcerated, investigators were determined to put the pieces together in the student murder cases and secure a conviction. Then, following an incredibly tense deliberation, Danny was indicted by a grand jury on five counts of homicide, three counts of battery, and three counts of armed burglary. 
the state of Florida made it very clear that they would be seeking the death penalty in this high-profile case. While awaiting trial, Danny struck up a friendship with a career criminal named Bobby Lewis, who just so happened to be friends with serial killer Ted Bundy during his time at the institution. As the two grew closer, Danny started confessing to the murders, and he eventually asked Bobby to serve as a mediator to relay the information to investigators. So, in January 1993, a task force arrived to interview Danny with Bobby, and I don't think anyone was prepared for what he would tell them. It's possible that the reason Danny would only speak through Bobby simply came down to power. He did it because he could. He likely felt he had very little control while in jail. The way that he conveyed information was one of the few things that he could control. He may have felt that it would be somewhat frustrating for police that he would only speak through another person, and he enjoyed this small bit of power. As the twisted confession unraveled, investigators learned the horrifying truth of what really happened to Danny's victims in their final moments, spoken through Bobby Lewis. He first explained how he set up a campsite in Gainesville, which is where he later recorded the haunting songs detailing the murders. However, he also recorded cryptic diary-like passages, with one directed at his family saying, You just pushed me away at a young age, Pop. I wanted to make you proud of me. I let you down. I'm sorry for that. Well, I'm going to sign off for a little bit. I got something I got to do. Then, just a few hours later, he went around turning doorknobs and peeping in windows until he stumbled upon Sonia and Christina's apartment. Danny said that Christina was asleep on the sofa, and he simply stood over her before deciding to look upstairs and see who else was home. That's when he found Sonia asleep in her room amidst piles of boxes waiting to be unpacked. Danny quickly taped Sonia's mouth shut to stifle her screams and bound her wrists. Then, after violently assaulting her, he stabbed her to death with a four-inch hunting knife. After killing Sonia, Danny went back downstairs and subdued Christina in the same manner before slicing off her clothing. The sick predator then assaulted her and stabbed her in the back five times. Oh, but he didn't stop there. Danny went back upstairs to Sonia's room and dragged her body across the bed to an unnatural position and returned to do the same to Christina. It's believed he took these cruel extra steps to startle whoever found the girls and gain notoriety. Finally, he ate a banana and an apple from their kitchen before leaving. Next, Danny stated that he stalked Krista Hoyt for several days before breaking into her home and lying in wait. When she returned, he admitted to assaulting the young woman before stabbing her to death. The mutilation of her body occurred post-mortem, but shockingly, he left her apartment and came back later in the day when he realized his wallet was missing from his campsite. While he didn't find his wallet, Danny impulsively decapitated her corpse during this return visit. Afterward, he arrogantly contacted authorities, but not about the grisly murder he'd just committed, but rather to see if anyone had turned in his wallet. Moving on to the killings of Tracy and Manuel, Danny claimed to have been peeping around prior to settling on the pair. Then he used a screwdriver to break in and immediately went to Manuel's bedroom to subdue him as he slept. He stabbed the college student relentlessly, noting that he put up an intense fight that required Danny to stab him eight or nine more times for around a minute. According to Danny, Manuel had called out to Tracy, urging her to run for her life. Unfortunately, after witnessing the horror in the other room, Tracy retreated back into her bedroom and locked the door. Danny kicked in the door and wrapped her hands and mouth in duct tape before assaulting and killing her. Finally, he posed her body in the hallway, stole a shirt from Manuel's dresser, and ran off into the night. Danny claimed to have acted alone and said he had never met Ed Humphrey. Despite the fact the police were convinced the two had worked together. Oh, and get this. Ed was now completely denying any involvement in the killing and insisted that his name be cleared. A grand jury eventually concluded that Ed Humphrey should not be held responsible for the Gainesville slayings following Danny's twisted confession. However, Ed's mental state had severely deteriorated from his time spent in jail by that point. Danny began blaming the slayings on an alternate personality known as Gemini. While he also admitted to other assaults and robberies in the area that he had not been charged for, he said those were the only homicides. Oh, besides the triple murder in Shreveport of the Grissom family, of course. Danny told investigators that he would only discuss that incident once they had handled the Gainesville cases. However, some details in his account didn't match the evidence, such as where he supposedly buried the murder weapon and how he assaulted Tracy. Danny's long-awaited trial commenced on February 15, 1994, with numerous counselors available to support jurors after viewing the gruesome crime scene photos. 
Shockingly, investigators believe the motive to be fame, as he seemed obsessed with the notoriety gained by Ted Bundy following his heinous crimes. During opening statements, prosecutors pleaded with the jury to keep an open mind when the defense team presents their argument. I don't know what they're going to offer to offset me and try to get an excuse for a man who has killed five people like this, but whatever it is, we get a chance to rebut it. I'm asking you to commit to me that you will keep an open mind when you hear whatever their psychiatrist, psychologist, or friends of the family say, we still get to present rebuttal evidence to that. And it's real important that when they put on a psychologist, don't make up your mind if what he says, you wait to hear what ours says. But then, Danny surprised everyone by announcing that he would plead guilty to all charges, thus taking the trial straight to the penalty phase. It's possible that Danny knew that he could not win, so he wanted to go out on his own terms. This was his last-ditch effort at taking back control. After hearing the jury's recommendation, the judge handed down the death penalty. While awaiting his execution, Danny prepared a written statement confessing to the Shreveport murders. He also began dating while in prison and eventually got engaged to a journalist named Sandra London, who he had been introduced to by Bobby Lewis. Though fascinating, it can be difficult to understand why anyone would begin dating a man who has confessed to being a serial killer. However, Danny comes across as very charming, charismatic, and likable, as psychopaths often do. There's also an element of excitement in dating someone who is a convicted killer. Women who choose to correspond with a murderer may get a thrill of danger while also having the security of knowing there is no actual threat while they remain behind bars. Around this time, Danny also had the audacity to defend her in court against public scrutiny. Miss London and myself have been corresponding for almost a year now. Regardless of what Williams has said, Miss London is of the highest caliber, sincere and honest, a woman of extraordinary talents. If I were her, I would sue Williams for slander and defamation of character. Danny likely enjoyed being the center of attention while giving this monologue. Getting up from his chair immediately after he finished reading was a show of power. He wanted the interviewer to know that he was in charge. Oh, and he also took a moment to serenade her following his sentencing. I recall the day I first saw you I reached out to say I love you But it was hard to say I couldn't touch you So tell me, baby, what were my words? All my tears run together Down the path you choose to follow Mr. Rollins, tell me, baby, what were my words? All my tears run together what were my words? All my tears run together, baby. Just like my hand. Okay, you get one song and answer, Mr. Roth. On October 25th, 2006, the nightmare which went on to inspire the 1996 horror film Scream finally ended when Danny Rowling was executed by lethal injection in front of nearly 50 spectators, including some family members of his victims. The killer reportedly sang a rambling hymn-type tune on his deathbed, calling on songs from his childhood to bring him peace, not that he deserved any. Here are a few red flags from this case. Danny's past illegal behavior, including multiple armed robberies, were a warning sign that his crimes may escalate. The attempted murder of his father was a signal that he may be capable of further violence. Unfortunately, there was likely nothing any of his victims could have done differently. All of the Gainesville murders were committed at the home of the victims, where they likely felt safe. The main preventative measure in this case would have needed to occur many years earlier, when Danny was a child. If you suspect that a child is being abused or exposed to violence in the home, please report this to your local authorities or call the National Child Abuse Hotline at 1-800-4-A-CHILD, 1-800-422-4453. Now, let's move on to the next horrific true crime case. Elise Poller was a 15-year-old girl from Arroyo Grande, California, when her life was suddenly stolen in a manner so evil, it's almost incomprehensible. Still, as the investigation into her brutal murder unfolded, police were stunned not only by the killer's identity, but also by their calculated planning and bizarre motive. Our story begins on the night of July 22nd, 1995. Elise had just said goodnight to her parents, and as far as they knew, she headed straight to bed. 
However, Elise, who was going through a rebellious phase, had other plans for her evening that didn't include an early bedtime. So once the coast was clear, the young girl slipped out of her family's home for some late night fun, fully intending to sneak back in before anyone even noticed she was gone. But that's not what happened at all. The following day, Elise's parents woke up to an absolute nightmare. Their beloved daughter was nowhere to be found. Panic-stricken, they rushed to the police station to report her missing. Unfortunately, based on Elise's alleged recreational drugs and alcohol use, authorities initially assumed that she had voluntarily taken off. However, her parents argued that she was a good kid with a bright future and that she would never run away from her close-knit family. So the Arroyo Grand Police began canvassing the area, and before long, the media had picked up on Elise's story. Countless tips started flooding in about possible sightings of the teenager in nearby towns, but they all turned up nothing. Still, those leads added to the theory that she might have run away, causing both investigators and her family to doubt that she had met with foul play. But they were in for the shock of a lifetime. Nearly nine months after Elise vanished, a fellow high school student named Royce Casey walked into the police station with a jaw-dropping admission. The 16-year-old confessed that he had killed Elise and even told detectives where to find her body. Oh, but that wasn't all. Royce also admitted to them that he hadn't acted alone. Royce pointed to 15-year-old Jacob Delashmut and 14-year-old Joseph Fiorella as his accomplices in the crime. The three boys went to school with Elise but were said to have very little regard for their academic futures. They were heavy into illegal substances and members of a death metal band called Hatred. The trio was also known to hang out in a spot known as the Pipe of Death, an abandoned drainage pipe where a young boy allegedly fell to his death a few years earlier. Naturally, investigators wanted to know what had compelled Royce to come clean after all that time had passed, but no one was expecting the answer he gave. Beyond citing newfound religious beliefs as his reasoning behind the confession, Royce also explained that his friends might kill again, and he feared that he would be their next victim. Hatred's songs featured lyrics about murder and their allegiance to the devil. Despite being the youngest in the group, Joseph was considered the ringleader, and he took his dark obsession to dangerous levels. In addition to his collection of books on the occult, like I'm talking a whole library in his own bedroom, he also performed sick rituals devised by the Satanist Aleister Crowley, including crucifying frogs before eating them to achieve great spiritual power. Cruelty towards animals as a child is often a precursor of further violent behavior toward people, including murder. As if that wasn't unsettling enough, all three boys were drawn to the official Church of Satan website. Joseph and Jacob actually paid $100 each to become card-carrying members and priests of the religious organization. So how did Elise get mixed up in this satanic fixation, you ask? Well, be warned that the truth is more shocking and terrifying than you could ever imagine. It all started when Joseph and Jacob began to post elaborate stories on satanic chat groups about human sacrifices. They outlined bizarre rituals involving the butchering of female virgins that would earn them a ticket to hell. The delusional youth also believed that this offering to the devil would make them better at playing music and ultimately give them the level of craziness needed to become famous. Spoiler alert, it didn't. Regardless, it was with this diabolical plan in mind that the boys started looking for a victim and for reasons unknown, they were determined to find someone with blonde hair and blue eyes. Jacob, who was regarded as the most friendly and social of the bunch, was tasked with finding their sacrificial lamb. However, the boys had a bad reputation around town, making it difficult for them to find anyone willing to hang out with them. That's when Jacob remembered Elise Poller with her big blue eyes and blonde locks. The two had met at a drug counseling center after getting in trouble for possessing illicit substances at school. While they weren't friends per se, they were at least acquaintances, so Jacob figured it was worth a shot. A few months before the murder, Elise was confronted by the boys while walking home from school. They shouted at her, asking for help and saying someone had fallen down the embankment and injured their leg. She approached and looked down the slope, finding no one to be there, and as she turned around, the boys surrounded her with maniacal gazes. Then, without warning, they pushed her back down the embankment, but unbeknownst to all of them, Elise's mother had witnessed the entire ordeal. She raced over to help her daughter, and the boys ran away. When asked about what had happened, Elise told her mother that she thought the boys were trying to play a harmless game. Little did she know that they had something far more sinister in mind that day. Still, Elise saw them as intriguing and different from everyone else, and naively, she didn't sense any of the boys as a threat. 
She was particularly fond of Jacob, and they started talking more, with him inviting her to meet up at the Pipe of Death on several occasions, but Elise declined. However, it wasn't until a chance encounter at a party on July 21st, 1995, that Hatred's evil plan finally took motion. Jacob asked Elise for her phone number and offered to supply her with marijuana later that night. She agreed to sneak out after her parents went to bed and meet the band members just a few steps from her home for a quick smoke session. So on that fateful night, Elise stuffed pillows under her bed covers to fool her parents if they peeked in her room and called out the last thing she would ever say to them. I love you and I'm going to bed. Always trusting, it never even occurred to her that the three outcasts she was about to meet might be capable of harming her, let alone killing her in an occult ritual. Upon meeting the boys, they all decided to ingest a form of acid before venturing into a nearby eucalyptus grove to smoke. At some point, Elise lost her footing and stumbled to the ground, prompting one of the boys to violently grab her hair and pull her into the dense underbrush. Suddenly, one of them whipped off a belt and wrapped it around her neck, tightening it until her eyes bulged and she could barely breathe. Elise lost consciousness but woke up a short time later to the boys taking turns stabbing her in the neck with a knife. She desperately fought for her life and even attempted to scream for help, but it was no use. The attackers stifled the helpless girl's cries by stomping on her neck. Violence sometimes escalates when multiple people are involved in an attack, due in part to feeling less responsible as other people can share the blame. The level of brutality may even increase, perhaps as each person tries to one-up each other. Recounting that night, Royce later told investigators that Elise was on the ground praying to God and calling for her mom. Elise suffered 12 stab wounds and then was dragged to a nearby tree, which the boys had previously dubbed a sacrificial altar. Investigators actually believe that at least one of the boys returned several times to defile her decomposing body after the incident. According to the three offenders, that was the final element of their satanic ritual. Over the next nine months, Elise's body remained hidden in the eucalyptus grove until Royce's guilty conscience caught up with him. His relationship with Joseph and Jacob had become somewhat detached, and he reportedly only spent time with them because he was afraid they would kill him if he left hatred. Royce also began attending a church of God regularly. Still, his remorse grew and finally reached a breaking point when he happened upon a missing persons flyer for Elise. That's when Royce decided it was time to set the record straight. Following his shocking confession, police discovered Elise's skeletal remains in the exact spot he had indicated, and all three boys were subsequently arrested. The preliminary hearing began in February 1997, with the boys making shocking statements about their obsession with the band Slayer during much of the proceedings. In his deposition, Joseph brazenly stated that the band Slayer started to influence the way I looked at things. Of course, Slayer was in no way responsible or to blame for the actions of Joseph, Royce, and Jacob, but Elise's parents still decided to try and take legal action against the band. Slayer's legal representation responded by pointing out that the First Amendment protects their music. Still, the Pollers argued that they aren't trying to stop the production, but rather control how it is marketed to kids. While the band largely remained quiet about the lawsuit, lead singer Tom Araya remarked, we're part evil. If we were really evil, we would be doing everything we're writing about. The case was ultimately reviewed and dismissed by a judge on the premise that the claims violated the band's right to freedom of speech. However, the judge made sure to note that Slayer lyrics are repulsive and profane, but they do not direct or instruct listeners to commit the acts that resulted in the vicious torture murder of Elise Pollard. All of that aside, Joseph ultimately accepted a plea deal that entailed dropping all other charges if he pled guilty to first-degree murder. As a result, he was sentenced to 26 years to life in prison and only showed remorse after hearing of his fate. Royce and Jacob were given the same sentence, but avoided life without parole by pleading no contest. Royce was granted parole suitability in 2021, and despite Elise's family feeling okay about his possible release, the governor ultimately reversed the decision. So while he won't be seeing the light of day anytime soon, the fate of Jacob and Joseph still hangs in the balance, as they have parole hearings scheduled for 2022 and 2024, respectively. Red Flags and What You Should Do Jacob killing frogs as part of a satanic ritual was a warning sign that he may be capable of violence against people. In fact, many serial killers have a history of abusing animals when they were children. Jacob, Joseph, and Royce's unhealthy obsession with the Church of Satan and comments they made about human sacrifices on satanic chat groups were all additional warning signs. 
Having a preoccupation with violence indicates that someone may eventually cross the line from fantasy to reality. The boys pushing Elise down an embankment months before her murder was a huge red flag. It's possible that they intended to kill her at that time, but were only stopped because her mom witnessed the incident. You should be wary of any act of violence, even if it appears to be done in a joking manner. On that note, it's time for our last case of this video. Savannah Gold was an art student from Jacksonville, Florida, who has been described as a natural caregiver and true empath. The 21-year-old was able to spread happiness wherever she went, including her job at the Bonefish Grill, where she'd worked for the past two years. However, on August 2, 2017, she left home for a 5.30 shift at the seafood restaurant and never returned. Investigators quickly realized Savannah never even got the chance to clock in. An hour and a half after Savannah left for work, her mother received a strange message from her daughter's phone filled with typos reading, Hey, I just wanted to tell you and mom I met a really great guy and we are running away together. I love him and we are leaving tonight. I'll call you later when we get to where we're going. Just minutes later, Savannah's brother received a similar text, also riddled with misspellings that said, Hey, I quit. I'm leaving with my boyfriend. I can't do this shit, anything. I'm fine. Just want to get away. The Gold family knew that something was wrong right away, as the messages were very out of character for Savannah. So after calling and texting her phone repeatedly with no response, they contacted the police and reported her missing. Authorities quickly located Savannah's car in the Bonefish Grill parking lot, with the doors unlocked and the front left tire slashed. Furthermore, detectives ruled out robbery as a motive after finding her purse with cash and credit cards still inside near the driver's seat. The only thing that seemed to be missing was her cell phone. As Savannah's friends, family, and co-workers began passing out missing persons flyers around town, investigators looked to nearby surveillance cameras for clues. Fortunately, they were able to access footage from a camera overlooking the entire parking lot, and what they witnessed sent a wave of fear through the community. Savannah could be seen parking her car, and then immediately after, a silver Chevy Malibu entered the frame and parked directly beside her. She exits her vehicle and then stops to talk to someone inside the Malibu through the rolled down driver's side window for around 14 minutes. Next, Savannah climbs into the back seat, and once inside, the Malibu could be seen violently rocking from side to side, with one of the doors repeatedly swinging open and closed, as if someone was trying to get out. Finally, after roughly 90 seconds of what appeared to be a desperate struggle, the car went still and the driver emerged to grab something from Savannah's car, possibly her phone. They then slashed her tire and drove off with Savannah still inside. Police were able to discern that the driver was a male with short, dark hair, but the footage was too grainy to make an immediate identification. Realizing with horror that they had just witnessed an abduction caught on tape, detectives sprang into action and started working to identify the vehicle captured on the surveillance video. They also began interviewing anyone close to Savannah, including a chef and manager at the Bonefish Grill named Lee Rodart, who had been heavily involved in the search efforts. The 28-year-old had been in contact with Savannah's family and more than willing to help look for her. He also appeared frazzled and incredibly distraught over his co-worker's sudden disappearance. Lee told investigators that he hadn't seen her the entire day, but everything changed when investigators found out he was the owner of the Chevy Malibu. So Lee was called in for a second interview three days after Savannah went missing, and this time, Investigators noticed something that sent a chill down their spines. They asked Lee to remove his chef's coat, and when he did, it exposed several fresh cuts on his arms and neck, which he claimed to have been self-inflicted. Now, this is where things start to get really crazy. Lee continued to deny any involvement in Savannah's disappearance, but he started offering some more insight into their relationship as the interview dragged on. Uh, so we kind of connected and hung out for a little while, uh, I'd probably say a period of two, three months. Beyond being co-workers, Lee explained that he and Savannah had been casually sleeping together behind his long-term girlfriend's back for the past eight months. Oh, and Lee was no stranger to Savannah's loved ones. In fact, one of her closest friends told police that Savannah and Lee spent quite a bit of time together outside of work and referred to him as her on-again, off-again boyfriend. Savannah's mother also reported that she was supposed to meet Lee for dinner at their home one evening, but he failed to show up. 
Faced with this information, Lee admitted that there was more to their relationship, but claimed he had recently broken up with Savannah. However, he said she got really upset and started telling co-workers about their little secret, which went against company policy. I heard that she has been basically telling a lot of people at work that um, we hooked up a bunch, like, couple days before that and that she was going to like tell about the whole situation and you know try to get me fired and, and why, like why would that get you fired I, I, I well don't, I don't I'm a manager and she's an employee so okay I mean, so afraid of losing both his girlfriend and his job Lee confronted Savannah in the parking lot and claimed to have said I would appreciate you know I need you to stop Lee continued to tell detectives that Savannah didn't respond well to his request and an argument erupted between them. Still, he maintained his innocence and said that Savannah then got into a green Ford truck with someone and drove away. And she got out, mm -hmm. and it looked like she was either texting or calling somebody, okay. um, because as she started walking towards the, there's an entrance to, bon to the plaza. Okay, yeah, that's um, closer towards yeah. 295? Yeah. yeah, okay. I wouldn't say she was walking along the edge of the plaza, but she was walking maybe towards this way mm -hmm. and I would say an older model Ford pickup, mm -hmm. green, okay. uh, drove past me and around and she got in. Okay. He also made sure to mention several times that Savannah took her phone. She had her phone in her hand, she got out of the car and walked towards the main entrance from San Jose. Unfortunately for Lee, cameras don't lie, and there was no green truck seen in the surveillance footage. However, up until this point, Lee was unaware of exactly how much investigators had gathered from the cameras, but when they finally told him, he changed his story. Lee suddenly confessed to killing Savannah, but insisted that he had acted in self-defense. She was hitting me. I just, she wouldn't stop. And I'd... He claimed that Savannah was attacking him in a drug-fueled rage, so he reacted by pressing his hands around her neck to make her stop. And it went back and forth, and I just squeezed him hard. Stop. He then heard a pop and realized she was dead. But what he said next unnerved even the most seasoned detectives. I go home. know what to do so um I have five bit in my back on and I put it there. Although he breaks down and cries several times during this interrogation, it's unclear if he's expressing genuine remorse over what he did, or the fact that he got caught, or if he is simply putting on an act. Lee admitted to attempting to burn and bury Savannah's body in his backyard before he put her corpse in his trunk and drove to a nearby pond, where he dumped the remains. He also admitted to sending her family text messages from her phone to try and make it appear that she had run away. It's possible that when Lee went to talk to Savannah, he didn't intend to kill her, but instead he acted in a moment of rage. This could explain why the crime appears to be so disorganized. He appeared unaware that there were security cameras facing toward their vehicles, the text messages to her family were also full of typos and appeared to have been sent in a rush. Following the intense confession, Lee was left alone in the interrogation room. Lee's obvious distress and comment to himself about going to jail all support the theory that this killing may have been the result of a violent temper rather than a killing that was carefully thought out. He appears to just now be realizing the consequences of his actions. Meanwhile, a dive team was deployed to recover Savannah's remains and she was found exactly where Lee said she would be in the water. The body was found within a blanket and plastic sheet bound with duct tape. During the autopsy, medical examiners found burns to 75% of Savannah's body, and the cartilage in her thyroid had been fractured. Still, they didn't believe it would be instantaneous, 
and could only report that her death was violent, so we might never know what really happened in that car. Oh, but just for the record, there were no drugs found in Savannah's system, hugely discrediting Lee's story of self-defense. As a result, Lee Rodart was arrested and charged with second-degree murder, tampering with evidence and abuse of a corpse. He pleaded not guilty despite the detailed confession, and even tried to bring in the stand-your-ground law as his defense, which implies that a person has the right to respond to threats without fear of criminal prosecution. When that attempt was denied, he changed his plea to guilty to avoid a life sentence and was given 40 years behind bars. If you ask Savannah's family, that punishment is not nearly harsh enough. Red Flags The fact that Lee frequently changed his story about Savannah was a warning sign that he might not be telling the truth. How to Avoid Similar Situations Be aware of your surroundings and parking lots and parking garages. If someone immediately pulls in right next to you, especially when there are lots of available parking spaces, consider erring on the side of caution and moving your car. Unfortunately, that may not have made a difference in this case as Lee was someone that Savannah knew well and trusted. If your romantic partner has a violent temper, even if they haven't been abusive toward you, alarm bells should be ringing as their behavior could escalate. For example, if your partner is angry and punches the wall, consider that this violence could be directed at you in the future. If you and your partner are arguing and they throw something, knock things over, or even start driving aggressively, these are scare tactics used to intimidate you. These behaviors can and often do intensify.